Well, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very pleased to be here today. So I will be moderating session number four, the strategy and tactics of the protests. So the first presentation will, uh, will be by Dr. Neil Ketchley. He is lecturer in Middle East politics at King's College. Um, his work focuses on protests and revolution in the MENA region. And his first book is entitled Egypt in a Time of Revolution. It was published with Cambridge University Press in 2017. And then the second speaker is Mohammed Al Said. Um, he's recently finished his MA in history at SOAS, and his research is mainly around subaltern and labor history, humanities, education, and memory studies in postcolonial Egypt. Um, Neil, would you like? Lots of applause. Can can everyone hear me? Do I have to sound right next to the microphone, or is is this okay? Yeah, it's all right. Okay. You want me to next to the microphone? Okay, so I can't pace nervously around. Great, cool. So um, I think that we're pressed for time, so I'll, I'll get cracking. So um, what I'm gonna present now is part of a book project on the 1919 revolution that I've been working on for maybe two years. Uh, but I'm just gonna present a very thin sliver uh, of the book. Um, and in doing so, try to give some kind of entree into the dynamics of the mobilization, especially during the very initial period. So, uh, health warning, there are graphs. Um, so, uh, this is a time series graph looking at the occurrence of protest over time, right? The x-axis is daily interval data. The y-axis is the number of protests that occur in Egypt. So, what should be pretty striking is the red dotted line, right? This is the uh, 8th of March, 1919, when Saad Zahulul is initially arrested along with three other members of the WAFT. And then on the, 90, uh, and on the 9th of March, I taken to Alexandria and then put on a boat uh, to uh, Malta. So what's really striking uh, about this from a kind of social science perspective is that, first of all, if you look at the time series to the left of it, there aren't very many events. Actually, if you go further back in time, the 1919 revolution, it doesn't come out of nowhere, but in the weeks preceding uh, the outbreak of protest, there's very little mobilization uh, at all. I'll talk about the empirical basis of the data uh, in a minute. But what you can see is, is that the first protest happens on the 8th of March. It involves students. The first recorded protest that I could find is of a student protest outside of the British residency in what is now Garden City, in where the, the British embassy is. Um, but within days, it's spread across the country. Uh, we see the peak of protests happen on the 18th of March. There's nearly 70 protests across the entire country in just one day. So this looks at the spread of protest over time. This looks at the, the spread of the 1919 revolution over space. Some of you at the back may not be able to see it. Some of these uh, shapes may look a bit weird because these are the district boundaries of Egypt in 1919. And I'll talk about how you can recreate this kind of spatial data uh, in a minute. But the pattern should be pretty clear. So each map represents one day. So on the top left-hand side, that's the 8th of March. That's where we find our first protest. By the 9th of March, protest has spread to Alexandria. By the morning of the 10th of March, we have our first protest outside of the major two cities in Tonta, in Gharbeya, in the Nile Delta. We can see that by uh, the uh, 12th of March, protest has spread not just throughout the Nile Delta, but also to Said, to Upper Egypt. By the end of the second week, protest has become a national phenomenon. Right? This is, from a sociological perspective, extremely impressive. Right? This is a real nationwide mass mobilization. And I'm gonna try for the next 20 minutes or so to try to explain this pattern. Before I do so, maybe it's just worth reflecting on how people are protesting during this early phase. So I've talked about when people protested and where they protested. It's also worth just briefly reflecting on how they protested. So again, this is a time series graph. Um, the top uh, bar chart, those are demonstrations. The bar chart in the middle, these are strikes. And the bar chart at the bottom are attacks. And by attacks, I mean attacks often on property. And what you can see, the trend, again, should be quite, uh, should be quite clear. Most of the protests during the beginning of the mobilization take the forms of strikes and demonstrations. And here, two protest sectors are extremely important, students and lawyers. Lawyers often strike and they cripple the court system, and students start demonstrations and marches that move through towns, cities, and, and indeed some, some villages. After the first week, however, the repertoire really changes. You start to see attacks on infrastructure, on rail stations, the pulling up of rail lines, the cutting of telegraph uh, 
uh, poles and lines, and the breakdown of, of telephonic communications. Right? And we'll, we'll return to this uh, in a minute. So when we look at the characteristics of the mobilization during this period, what's very striking is not just that this is a national mobilization that's spread across the entire country and is, people are really mobilizing in large numbers, but it's also, again, from a kind of sociological perspective, kind of surprising because there aren't really any obvious movements orchestrating it. We know that the hist from the history of the WAF that, you know, that from their formation um, in November of 1918 up until March 1919, this is not a movement with a cadre with a membership, with branches, with any kind of real coordinating capacity. And that's striking. Usually when we look at mass participation revolutions, you need to have some kind of orchestration. And yet, in Egypt, it's almost absent. John Chowcraft, who's just written a really magisterial book on popular protest in the region, summarizes the WAF thusly. The WAF, especially at the outset, had little in the way of a ramified organizational structure. And while it enjoyed the spontaneous loyalty of the insurrectionary crowds, it had few means of directing and channeling them, right? That is to say that when we're trying to explain this puzzle of why protest happens in some places and not others, at some times not others, it can't simply be reduced to people are following orders, right? Do you start, do you start to get new forms of organization in the months following? So on the right-hand side, this is actually a pamphlet from Ansura in Dahliya, um, calling for a protest, this is, this is from the archive, um, calling for a protest on the 9th of April at uh, 3.30 in the afternoon. And you start to get this kind of, you can find a residue in the archive of local forms of coordination, but in its very earliest phases, the, the phase that I'm going to talk about, these, these forms of local coordination are less obvious and apparent. It's also the case that when we're trying to explain the diffusion of process, one obvious channel through which protests might spread is through media, right? Just like we talk about Facebook resolutions in, in, in 2011, however critical we should be of that narrative, the underlying intuition is that people might protest because they hear about something. There's a grievance, Zahrul's arrest, right? And that this might spur on uh, mobilization. So the first, interestingly, when we look at the kind of uh, the documentary record of, 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 of publications about uh, the initial act that might have precipitated the revolution, that is the arrest of the Waft and their de deportation, the first uh, record that I can find comes actually from Al-Ahram, right? This is working with the microfilms, that's published on the 10th of March. 1919. Some other newspapers like Wadi Nil, Mas, Al Minbar, and so forth, they take days and days to report on this. And that's interesting, right? So we actually have protests already in Cairo, Alexandria, in Tante, in Gharbeya, even before local press coverage. And often those very initial protests, which were led by students and lawyers, that might suggest that these are not people who are just reacting, right? There are networks at stake. It's also worth just reflecting on what does Egypt look like generally in March 1919. We have a census from 1917, from the end of 1917. So we have some sense of what the country looks like in terms of its sociological profile. We know that the median literacy rate is about 11%. For males, it's lower, obviously, for women. But nearly 40% of the adult population are employed in the agrarian economy. They're, they're literally falahin, right? They're, they're peasants. At the same time, though, we have a lot of students, nearly 300,000 students in some form of tertiary or secondary education, and we have newspapers, right? 14 daily newspapers with a combined daily circulation of about 85,000 copies. So it's worth keeping these in mind when we try to answer the question. This is what I'll speak about for the rest of the presentation. How did mass protest diffuse and scale up in a semi-agrarian context characterized by political disorganization of the absence of very strong uh, movements. So very, very briefly, you know, we, we can use the MENA region. It's not just a site for the application of social science theory, but also to, to generate theory. And we know, we've studied revolutions uh, for you know, many revolutions, including revolutions in Egypt, but also elsewhere. And we have some expectations about how protest diffuses. One of the expectations that we get from the literature stresses the importance of interpersonal connections of relationality, that people protest because they hear that other people are protesting, or because people tell them they should protest, right? Now, what I'm gonna do is slightly problematize this and say that there's another really important factor that, that's at stake here, and that is there has to be infrastructure. There has to be communications. There have to be railways. There have to be telegraphs. There have to be telephones for diffusion to occur. And indeed, if we look comparatively across time and space, at the historical record, not just from Egypt but elsewhere, communications infrastructure features very prominently. The swing riots, the famous agrarian riots in the UK, occur and spread through the diffusion of the stagecoach line, 
The February Revolution in Russia happens two years before 1919, spreads through the railway network. The Muslim Brotherhood in the 1930s, some work I've done with a, with a co-author, Stephen Brooke, the biggest predictor of where the Brotherhood established their initial branches are if there are train stations there. Right? And so this would lead us to an assumption that actually when we're trying to explain the pattern of the 1919 revolution, the protest is going to spread fastest to the places that are most connected. Right? And we're going to test this. So first of all, how do you study protest? Right? If, you want to, if you want to explain diffusion, you've got to know where protest happens, where, when, and how. And so the standard technique in social science, which is actually a technique that we inherit from social historians, people like Eric Hobsbawm, and George Rudet, is we create event catalogs. We read local publications, journals, periodicals. So what I went and did, working with microfilms in the Dado Kutub and then in the British archives, is I created a data set of about 3,500 events that occur in Egypt, encompassing demonstrations, marches, protests, strikes, and so forth, from four Arabic language newspapers, Al Ahram, Al Minbar, Mas, Wadi Anil, the English language newspaper, uh, the Egyptian Gazette, which at this point is being published in Alexandria, but also security bulletins, daily intel briefs from the British residency, RAF reports where RAF planes during the very beginning of the revolution fly across the country on patrol to try to report and detect protests, foreign office correspondence, diplomatic cables, the Milner report, which goes back and tries to recreate uh, exactly what happens. And from this, we can try to systematically actually study the mobilization for the first time. I don't think anyone's done this before. So that, that lets us know where protest happens. We obviously then need to know where the communications infrastructure is, right? And again, we can do this using tools and techniques from empirical social science. So this is a map series uh, that I found. It's, it's in incomplete collections held at Harvard and at Kew in the British archives. Uh, and this is a map series that's published between 1916 and 1918. So contemporaneous to the revolution. And what I've done is I've digitized the map series and then I've done what's called georeference it. So each one of these squares that you can kind of see, these are in physical form, they're about this by this. And you georeference them, and from this you can harvest, harvest geospatial information. So a very obvious thing we can do is we can just get the district boundaries, Hadur al markets, right? From Egypt during this point. We can reconstruct what a district looks like. But these maps contain a lot more than this. These maps contain information about the location of every telephone, every telegraph office, every railway station, every main road in the country at this point. So we can systematically reconstruct where the communications infrastructure is. So here's an example. This is a map sheet uh, from, uh, from Garbiya. So there's a gray circle on it. This is over Zifta, which sees its first protest uh, on the 13th of March. And every one of these marks, if you can see them, I've added icons to them so they're a little bit more visible, but they may be a bit too small for you to read. That's, those are telephones. Those are post offices. Those are telegraph stations. The red line there, that's the main road. So what I've done, just to give you a sense of what I'm trying to get at, is I've drawn a spatial buffer around, in this case, Zifta, but we can do this for every sub-district in the country, every Sheikha and Nahya, and we can count how much communications infrastructure there is within the buffer. That is to say, we can systematically measure how connected a place is. Is this kind of clear? This kind of makes sense, what I'm, what I'm getting at here? Yeah? Great. So that's what I did. I, I spent uh, <laughs> several months doing this. Um, and what I've done is I've coded a variable. This is a quantitative study. This is the, I gave you the health warning at the beginning, where I've coded, for every sub-district in the country, I've coded one if it's within 30 minutes walking distance, which is about three kilometers, of a telephone, a telegraph office, or a post office, or a railway station. I've also uh, measured the distance from a, of a sub-district to a major rail terminal, because you, you want to be able to account for, for capacity, right? So there are some really big train stations and we know the arrivals by train stations for 1919. And I've also measured the distance to the main road. So if you look on the right-hand side, this is a map of Egypt at this point. And every dot is a sub-district. There's about 3,500 of them. And I've colored them by their quintile. And the intuition is basically this. Places that are colored more darkly have more communications infrastructure. So protests should spread there faster. Right? That's the basic intuition. And what I've done is, is I've got all of these variables and I've combined them into just one measure because they're quite highly correlated. Most telegraph offices at this point are in train stations, right? So one would almost perfectly predict the other. So what you do is you can combine those into just one variable using something called principal component factor analysis, which you don't care about, which is a, it's a statistical measure for, for data, data manipulation. And I've come up with just one measure, 
of how connected a subdistrict is. Right? And again, the intuition is if infrastructure matters, it should spread to the darker subdistricts faster than the lighter ones. So when you're trying to study systematically protest mobilization, there are obviously other factors at stake, not just how, much, how many telegraph offices there are or is it close to a train station. We know from the qualitative details of the case that other things matter, like students, like lawyers, right? And so what we can do is we can use census data and other government statistics from this point to try to account for that. So we're also going to test some other variables. So we know, for example, how many students there are in a district. And we might think on the right-hand side where it has expectations and then it has a plus or a minus. That, that tells us what we should find. More students probably means more protests faster. More lawyers probably means more protests faster. Distance to the of Lul's house. So I said that the waft at this point is not particularly coherent as a movement, but it is the case that Zahrul's house itself becomes a real center for mobilization, famously, Beit al right? Like it's, it becomes a site of the, the, the starts for many protest marches that go uh, through Cairo. So we might think that places that are closer to that may just see protests faster, not because of communications infrastructure. There's obviously other forms of communications infrastructure in Egypt at this point. There's the Nile, right? So we might want to measure the distance between a sub-district and the Nile. We also know the home districts of the arrested WAFT leaders. We might think that places where the WAFT leadership actually come from, they may have heard about the arrest faster, and so they may mobilize in response. And finally, we probably think that places where there are just more Egyptians are probably going to see protests faster, not least because you know, where, do, where do people establish post offices and, and railway stations? Where the population is, right? So those are our variables. This is what we're going to do. Uh, this is, this is, this is, I'm going to try and avoid the language of, 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 kind of technical social science here. But here's the intuition. In Egypt at this point, there's 3,745 subdistricts. And we're going to observe them every single day during just the first week of the revolution. And we're going to say, why do some of them see protest faster than others? Right? And we're going to model this. Uh, the outcome variable here is, does a protest happen, yes or no, which is expressed on the left-hand side. This is a Bernoulli formula. Does a protest happen? On the right-hand side, which is on the other side of the equal sign, we're going to test these variables measured at the sub-district and district level, these things here, and this, this variable here. And finally, this bit in the middle, I'm going to point to it because it's kind of important. This bit here, this is what's called an autocovariant. And the intuition here is that when we think about when protest spreads, it might not just be because there are more people or because there are more telegraph offices. It could just be because another protest has happened nearby the previous day and people have heard about it. There could be contagion dynamics. And that's what that variable there does. It basically marks as one whether a sub-district is within two kilometers of another subdistrict that saw a protest on the previous day. This accounts for something called spatial autocorrelation. So this is the design. I'm not sure that everyone will have followed this, but hopefully the intuition should be clear. And these are the results. So, so this is like a nicer way of, of, of trying to present statistical analysis. If any of you have had, ever had to suffer a, a quantitative paper, you may have seen like tables with coefficients numbers and then in parentheses, standard errors, maybe some asterisks to tell you if something is statistically significant or not. This is the same information presented, hopefully in a bit more intuitive way. So on the left-hand side, these are the variables that I introduced you to earlier. Those dots, those are the coefficients. That's the estimated mean effect of the variable on the incidence or the likelihood of having a protest. Those whiskers, those are the 95% confidence intervals. So those, that's where we think the effect will fall 95 times out of 100. Anything that's on the right-hand side of the red line, that means it's going to be more likely. If it's on the left-hand side, that means it's less likely. If the whiskers cross the red line, that means that we're not confident if it's positive or negative. That is, that is, it's not statistically significant, right? We can't be sure of the effect 95 times out of 100. So we'll, we'll go through this. So we'll start from the bottom. So sub-districts that are within, other, within, within three kilometers of another sub-district that saw a protest the previous day, it gets complicated, are much more likely to see a protest the next day. That makes sense, right? These are, these are contagion dynamics. Places with more population are much more likely to see protest. Again, that makes sense. That's, that's not a particularly striking finding. The distance, the sub-district's distance to the Nile doesn't really matter. The distance to Sargs Lul's house, it looks like it reduces with distance, which makes sense, which might suggest that it's an important factor, but it's not statistically significant. Legal professionals, the more legal professionals you have, actually seems to decrease the risk of a protest 
but it's not statistically significant. You can see that the whiskers cross zero. Subdistricts located in districts with more students are much more likely to see mobilization sooner on. Students really seem to matter. Right? One of the narratives about 1919 is that it's a kind of a peasant uprising or revolt. If you look systematically at the mobilization, the, the evidence for this is actually quite weak. Students are really a key factor. People like Ahmed Abdullah have, have written about this. Waft home districts, it looks like places where the Waft leaders come from also are more likely to see protests sooner, but it's not quite statistically significant. And then the top, the thing that I'm really interested in, communications infrastructure. Places that were more connected were much more likely to see protests sooner controlling for all those other things. Right? We can visualize this in a different way. Again, sorry, graphs. The x-axis here, the horizontal axis, this is this, is this communications infrastructure variable that I introduced you to. Right? On the further to the left you are, that means the less connected you are. The further to the right you are, the more connected you are. The y-axis is the probability of having a protest. What you can see is, in places with very little communications infrastructure, that is here, right? the likelihood of having a protest is nearly zero, right? Infrastructure really matters, right? If you go for the fifth or the 95th percentile in terms of connectivity, it basically quadruples the risk of having a protest within this week period. There really is systematic evidence that protest diffuses through communications infrastructure. So, yeah, thanks. So, if, you're, if you've ever had to like, deal with statistical work before, you probably will know that statistical results can be quite sensitive to things like how you measure things, how you estimate things. So, inevitably, you have to go through robustness checks. So, one of the most striking factors about revolution during this point is that of the 3,000 odd subdistricts, only 70 of them actually see, a, see one or more protest. So, that is to say, it's a rare event, right? And that could be problematic. So we have, to, we have to account for that by trying other statistical estimators, like rare events, logistic regression. It doesn't change. The findings are not driven just by our data. Right? You can estimate it in a number of different ways. The findings are extremely robust. You can do things like, you might think, well, maybe I'm measuring proximity to infrastructure. I've, done, I've said three kilometers, but that seems a bit arbitrary. Right? What about two and a half kilometers, or three and a half kilometers, or one kilometer, or four kilometers? That is to say, change the measurement of proximity to infrastructure. If you do that, the result doesn't change. You can also do things like, maybe there are just other factors at stake that we're not taking into account. Maybe, there's, maybe districts are just really different from another, right? Maybe Meet Khomer is just fundamentally different from Baba Shari'a, which sounds plausible, right? Or maybe Cairo is just systematically different from Kafr al-Sheikh. What you can do then is you can brute force use something called fixed effects. So you can introduce a unique variable for every single place, and that absorbs that uniqueness and just confines attention to variation in where protest happens. If you do that, the results don't change. There's no omitted variable bias at the district or the governor level, or indeed at the day level. You can also use day fixed effects. So I'll wrap this up quickly. What are the conclusions then? Well, relational accounts of diffusion, that is, if you just think that protest spreads through people connecting with each other, it elides something quite important, and that is that the built environment is what structures the patterning of, the, of protest, both in terms of its timings and its locations. As the Egyptian case shows, during a revolutionary episode, protest is really delimited by the extent of the country's communications infrastructure. Less connected places, it's very, very difficult for protest to spread there, and that makes sense, I think. Finally, and this is in the, against the backdrop of a broader, broader book project, I think these findings, they really underscore how you can revisit these kinds of historical episodes with, new, with maybe data that hasn't been properly exploited before or that can be exploited with these newer analytical techniques and you can get really interesting findings. Great, thank you very much. Cheers. First, uh, it's a very special moment to be here in SOAS um, after being a student, to be a speaker. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, what I'm going to present today is actually uh, um, kind of my thesis after uh, spending three months in the British Archive last year. Uh, so I thought it's worth to apply for this conference and, and see what will happen. And uh, I was really astonished that I got accepted. <laughs> um, uh, so thank you for inviting me here. Um, what I'm going to talk today um, is about 1919 revolution. Uh, in the isthmus of Suez Canal, uh, and I mean here Port Said and Ismailia, especially. Um, 
And I will talk about it through the lens of labor, and I'm talking about Suez Canal company labor. For, for a simple introduction, why I'm interested in this, why I've become interested in this project uh, since starting thinking about my thesis. This is a photo from Porsaid. Um, first, um, because labor history is always, um, our main body about labor history is always entangled uh, with nationalism. So every time we mention labor, we mention how labor w was part of nationalist movement and labor movement was just, um, um, was in a total agreement with nationalist movement. Um, and there is a big problem in this because um, to, uh, that means that there was, uh, the, there was um, a big gap in the role of uh, foreign labor. Um, who played actually a big role in, in the labor movement in Egypt. And, and thanks to works like uh, Professor Garman about uh, Italian and Greek labor in, in Egypt, um, it emphasized how um, foreign labor were actually a big part of labor movement and the nationalist approach to labor, uh, labor history in Middle Eastern studies cast a shadow on this. Second is uh, the way we talk about labor history is we talk about strikes. Um, and this is actually misses uh, the richness of every day. So when we talk about labor, we, uh, as Joel Benin said it, we only consider labor when they were activists, when they were on a strike. So um, I'm trying to, to put emphasis on non-strike moments of labor history, especially in the South Canal area. Third, when we, when we talk about nationalism and the spread of Egyptian nationalism, um, big, body, big body of the literature is talk about intellectual debates, especially in Cairo. So we are talking about nationalism, as this, as this idea came from Europe and spread it. And we are talking about debates between um, um, people who think of Ummah and people who think of Watan. Um, but I'm interested more in nationalism, in, in, uh, not in cafes between, in, and debates between Afandis, but also in, in, the Arab, in the huts of Arab um, inhabitants of Poussaid and Somalia. Um, the fourth point is related to this, because uh, when we talk about nationalism, it's, it's mainly Cairo. And I would like to quote Professor Pesparon in this, um, history of Egypt becomes synonym of history of Cairo. So putting an emphasis on, um, on another place, um, and especially very unique place like Suez Canal, would illustrate another case of nationalism, another, another reason for emerging uh, of nationalism. With the reason here is, is mainly exclusion. It's not they have been convinced of certain idea. It's not because of a certain intellectual debate between labor, it's, it's exclusion mainly. It's kind of similar approach to what happened to Arab uh, soldiers in, um, in Mehmed Ali uh, army and how being excluded from the top ranking made them form this kind of identity. So what happened in Port Said and Ismailia in 1919 revolution? In March, the revolution started. Um, uh, there, was, there, there was an administration in Port Said, uh, seven killed and uh, 17 injured, the same in Ismailia. However, the real escalation happened in May. Um, in May 1919, the biggest strike happened. The most, uh, the, the biggest strike happened um, in the in the Suez Canal Company history, happened in May 1919. So first, um, to explain what is Suez Canal at this time, what is Suez Canal area? So Suez Canal area was still was part of Egypt, Poussaid, Ismailia, and Suez, but Poussaid and Ismailia were company towns. So we have Egypt as a semi-independent or semi-autonomous state from the Ottoman Empire. We have the British occupation, which had the, the, the largest military presence in Suez Canal. But also we had a big ruler, which, which was a company, the French company of Suez Canal, which because they, are the one who, they were the one who built this town and they were the one who was supplying it with water, electricity. So we have this hierarchy. And finally, we have capitulations that Egypt was, was, was uh, forced to have as part of the Ottoman Empire, which meant that big foreign communities used to, to be trialed in front of uh, their councils, consulates. So among this hierarchy, we have the Egyptian labor in the, in the, in the lower rank. In the, in the company itself, it, it modeled uh, according to the French, uh, French big companies. So we used to have, the company used to have like English and French uh, managerial elites. Mediterranean, mainly Greek and Italian intermediary, intermediaries like skilled workers, and finally at the lower uh, and the lower um, in the lower rank were the Egyptian labor. What happened in strikes that uh, um, a group of Greek workers uh, called La Phoenix uh, started this movement um, by 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 um, sending petitions to uh, the the company, asking for increasing wages and decreasing the working hours to eight hours. <coughs> 
and also asking for similar treatment uh, during um, um, any, any kind of injury, um, like European workers. The strike st lasted for one month, um, and it ended with a compromise from the company. But however, this, um, this strike didn't sabotage the, the maritime, um, the, the, Navy, the, the naval um, movement, because th there was a solidarity between the French and the British. At this moment, the British Army lends its naval personnel to the company to continue working. But I'm interested more in, in another kind of solidarity. It was a strike um, started by Greek workers in a moment that considered nationalist movement in Egypt, 1919 revolution. And here we have a, a letter um, uh, written by the workers, workers representative, written in French to the British High Commissioner in Egypt. So Greek and Italian and Egyptian writing in French to a British High Commissioner. And um, here in the signing, we have multiple names, but there is one name in Arabic, Muhammad, Muhammad Layot. Also, the, the, the pamphlets during the strikes were really interesting. They were multilingual, so here we have in English, we have here in French, and my, my preferred in Arabic. Um, and they are the same. Uh, they are the same, um, uh, the same demands. Um, so we have Greek workers, Italians, and Egyptian unifying together against uh, the French uh, company. Um, and if we thought about nationalist movement, we would think that only Egyptians would revolt or, and foreigners would, be, um, would step aside, especially 1919 revolution was accused by the British to be a xenophobic. So why is this moment was special and, and uh, how Suez Canal area affected this kind of uniqueness? Um, I, I propose three reasons. My argument is uh, there, there were three reasons for this kind of solidarity. First, this sense of family. So Suez Canal Company created kind of um, a corporate identity, if I would say, uh, in today's terms. They built schools, they built hospitals, they, are the one who built, they were the one who built the cities, and everyone feels that they are belonging to a certain family called Suez Canal. Um, and here I quote from uh, A.M. Malcolm, uh, one of the big British di uh, famous British directors, um, that he was doing these tours in Suez Canal and he was reporting saying a company provides this welfare status for all its employees and workers. He mainly, he mainly meant the Europeans. And they were grateful to be part of this harmonious family. So having this company um, uh, and having this welfare capitalism affected how people felt about the company and they felt it's their family and it's not just a business relation. And actually the workers used it in one of the petitions today asking the company to provide education for their children because they are part of the family. The second, the second reason is there is another kind of diachtomy which was not only Europeans and natives but also workers and employees. Um, which interestingly, a diachtomy would still uh, still happening today in, in nowadays is Ismaili and Porsaid. So there's a big discrepancy between who, who are workers and who are, who are employees, and and also back then. So the company had 4,000 workmen. Only um, 70, 70 of them were managerial, and they were mainly French and English. 120 uh, were uh, pilots, were Western Europeans, uh, and um, mainly Dutch, uh, uh, French, English. And the rest of the workers were either uh, intermediate, uh, Europe, like uh, Mediterraneans, like Greek and Italian, and um, Egyptians as mostly manual workers and non-registered. So this dichotomy between um, workers and employees played a big role of making Europeans feel more uh, common cause with Egyptians because they, they mix with them in uh, the shop floor. And, and there was no, no other way to, uh, to, make a big, to make a strong case against the company without um, having um, an, allying, an alliance with the Egyptian. And also the, the measures that the company take against workers, like cutting wages, really made the workers, European workers, feel that the, the, other, the, the employees are far detached from them and they wouldn't feel them and they, they would have a common, a common cause with the Egyptian uh, because they are workers as them. So we, we heal. We, we here feel this kind of class solidarity or this kind of like relationship in a shop floor in the ateliers affect uh, where Europeans position themselves against the European company. The third, the third cause is uh, the spread of communism and anarchism and all this kind of transnational solidarity that exceed nationalism. Um, we have here a British report uh, about a strike happened in 1931 and it states uh, two things. First, 
Um, and number four, here is the accused, the main, uh, the main person behind this strike, to be a communist. And this was in 1931, or to have communist thoughts. Um, so communism was already spreading, especially after the success of October Revolution. And the head of the Suez Canal Workers Syndicate, Dr. Skopoulos, he was one of, the one of the four people who founded the Egyptian Communist Party. So co communists had a big stronghold in Ismailia and Port Said and Suez. The second reason is um, European workers, uh, existence of European workers uh, affected how Egyptian workers knew uh, about uh, uh, European laws that protect workers in Europe. And, and uh, here the British report states it exactly. They're saying the existence of both French and Greek workmen, most of, most of them are quite ready to tell their Egyptian uh, comrades that about the numerous laws and safeguards to prevent exploitation of labor. So Suez Canal was, was kind of this connection between Europe and Egypt when we talk about labor politics. So yeah. So if we talk about cosmopolitanism, if we talk about communism, anarchism, uh, this multi-diverse places, um, usually called as cosmopolitan places, uh, either in academic articles like um, Claudine, uh, Claudine Potin, uh, book about Suez Canal saying, but calling uh, Suez Canal like Petite France Automair, like it's like a small France, or by memoirs like Sylvia Medelisky, uh, talking about talking of Port Said as this small city, mimicking small cities uh, in the southern France. Or um, also other reasons to call, to, to, you used to call them cosmopolitan place because of uh, this kind of diversity from French, English living there, Egyptians coming um, to work, but also various uh, Indian Ocean uh, um, um, uh, people like uh, Somalis and, and Yemenis coming as sea shipmen uh, and Indians coming as a part of the British army. So it, it, it was a very, very diverse place. But did this place represent a melting pot? Nationalism in Zism. So if we are talking about cosmopolitanism, anarchism, communism, how um, Suez Canal become a stronghold of nationalism? This is a line that I really like from uh, the nationalist drama Nasser 56, Nasser 56. And he's saying, I'm tired of searching for the Egyptian embassy in Port Said without finding it. It's, is that like we are talking about a different state? And people think that Egypt should have an embassy there. So why we are talking about this? The existence of Egyptian state um, and Egyptians' uh, position in Suez Canal was really unique, uh, unlike any other places in Egypt. So how the Arabs, in the eyes of Europeans, or how they called themselves uh, when they were call the Egyptians in this, uh, in this cities were calling themselves also Arabs, how they become Egyptian? Um, it was 1919 revolution moment. And um, the argument for this is that after this moment, they started to form groups and, uh, and did certain uh, celebrations that represented what uh, Anthony Dismiss uh, called like sim symbols of nationalism. So Anthony Dismiss is a professor who used an approach uh, to nationalism which called uh, ethnic symbolism. And he argues that uh, every, nationalist, uh, every nationalist movement needs symbols. And symbols here in Port Said and Ismailia were first establishment of al Masri club, the Egyptian club. It is the first the first Egyptian club in Suez Canal, and that's why they called it Al-Masri. They named it after the famous Said, the famous Said that we song, Omiya Masri, stand up in Egyptian. And here we can see interesting thing. First, Al-Masri was established 1920, just a few months after the revolution. Second, the slogan is so similar to the Egyptian flag at this time, and using pharaonic symbols, which represented the Egyptian nationalism. Um, and um, the, 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 main, um, the main reason behind calling it Al-Masri was this famous song during the 1919 revolution. The second thing is a celebration called uh, Alimbi. And it's a, a celebration only happens in Port Said and Ismailia before Sham and Nisim, the spring day. And it, it's kind of uh, hanging and burning uh, um, a mummy, uh, uh, not a mummy, um, kind of uh, uh, a dummy. Um, and it, it started just after revolution, after 1919, and the first dummy they burned it was Lord Alimbi. And there is a famous, uh, there is a really brilliant article by Professor Marion Billy called when, when Edmund Alimbi become a Limbi. And interestingly how this uh, celebration um, is really happening now, and every year the character change. And uh, last year it was an ISIS fighter. Hmm. So, oh. How the Ismus become an apartheid? 
So for me, nationalism happened because unlike the first part of the presentation, national uh, communism and anarchism and this kind of melting pot between workers, the, the living reality of, uh, of everyday uh, poor Said and Ismailia, it was an apartheid reality in, the, in, the, in the every sense of the word. From having categories like Europeans and natives, from having one neighborhood called the European neighborhood and the other one called the Arab town or the Arab neighborhood. So let's start how Bursaid and Somalia started. It was a company town. And for us Egyptians, we, because we have a strong state, we, we always don't think how, how it was a company town. We used to have a state in Egypt that controlled everything. Actually, in, in Port Said, the, the real ruler were, wasn't, the, weren't the British, uh, wasn't the British nor the Egyptian. It was a French company. This is a British report about ports in 1917. And um, the part here is like, at Port Said, the real ruler is a Suez Canal company. Egyptian government control is pr practically limited to fiscal rights and quarantine restriction imposed under international agreement. The Suez Canal company have thoroughly pursued a steady policy of extending and strengthening its control with the expansion of the port. And at present constitute a veritable imperium in an imperium. This is a famous word, famous phrase to describe the, co the company in Egypt, but actually we used to hear it from, um, in, in post-colonial time, especially during Nasser, that Suez Canal area is a state within a state or a state above the state. But this is a British report, this is not Nasser. Even the British were so annoyed. This is a plan of Smilea. Um, this part is actually, the whole of this is European neighborhood. And just this is the Arab neighborhood. And very, very small detail, which is how lands is here is a very really big one, and how it's here. Um, so not only the type of buildings is different, not only the inner, like the cultural life is different, but even the, 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 the exact space is different, and how Europeans used to live in all this space while Arabs has been, had been confined to only this place. And actually this caused now what we call LCD uh, buildings in Port Said. So having two, having two neighborhoods in one city, really different uh, from each other, between them uh, there, the, there is um, a clear line of separation, which was uh, one street uh, called Muhammad Ali in post cities. And crossing this line of separation uh, wasn't, um, wasn't an, uh, an easy thing. So for, for one event, a Sufi procession for Said uh, wanted to cross from the, European neighborhood, from the Arab neighborhood to the European neighborhood and the British army uh, fired uh, at them and they killed um, three people. In another time, Hassan al-Banna in Ismailia in 1929 had a demonstration and crossed with a large number from Arab neighborhood to European neighborhood and this caused a huge alert. And this actually what brought Hassan al-Banna under the scrutiny of British intelligence and um, Egyptian government. So having this clear separation, how people lived in this clear separation, how Arab workers after finishing jobs return, what Arab workers after finish, finishing their jobs uh, would return to. So the type of buildings in, um, in post-neighborhoods post neighborhoods are really different. In, in the first neighborhood, European neighborhood, it's a villa, they, are, they are usually villas. Anyone have, had been to Porsaid or Ismailia would recognize this kind of villas. It's the only thing we brag about now. Um, this is a striking difference. This is two photos from Ismailia at the same time. Here we have uh, the European neighborhood with all villas and gardens. And this is the Arab quarter, the Arab neighborhood. Um, and and um, I, will, I will just mention a few quotes describing the, the life in, in post-neighborhoods. Um, post so for European neighborhoods, um, how, how people were living, um, as, as I mentioned before, Sylvia Modelski is one of the inhabitants of Bursaid at that time, and she, she wrote uh, her memoir called Bursaid Revisited, describing the social life uh, high even by European standards, dance parties, sporting clubs, and mixed agenda of socialization, socializing in parts, and beaches mimicked the lifestyle of beach town in, in south of France. This is, we are talking about Port Said. In Ismailia, there was another um, testimony by Lieutenant, a French officer during World War II. He was saying, in the dining hall, in a veranda overlooking vertebral botanical garden complete with uh, one juvile palms, 
I find myself sitting beside a young, a young lady in a bank who born here 18 years back, talking to me of tennis, season tickets for music, reading and comedy. He asked, I, I asked her tips um, as I was visiting Cairo and it turned out that she hadn't been there. He says their entire Egypt consisted of season tickets of, for weddings in Bursaid and tennis in Ismailia. This is Bursa This is what we call Al Mamsha or the walking. Uh, this is just in front of the canal, and this is Bursaid. We have here famous Simon Arzit, which used to be one of the biggest malls in Egypt at the time, and all the signs are either in English or French, and and it seems more for European city. So for for Arab town, we actually we don't have a lot of accounts on what was happening in Arab towns. Um, in my thesis, I used the account by by Hassan Al Banna, who used to to know uh, Arab towns and used to live there during his time in Ismailia. Uh, but here I would like to refer to a, a journalist from, a report by a journalist from the Musawar uh, newspaper, and he was describing the Arab town in Ismailia in 1950, not in, in even 20 or 30. He was saying two views in deep contrast, the view of Afrangi or the European neighborhood and the view in Awashit al-Abid. The first is a neat heaven with trees and flowers, and the second is hill with clay built houses not suitable for chickens. Roads from clay, like village roads, shoesless children, and the entrenched poverty. It's called Arashet al-Abid, which is slave huts. And it really deserves this. It's only suitable for slaves. So talking of this kind of striking difference between Arabs and Europeans and how they experience the city, and going back to this idea of Borsaid or Ismaili as a cosmopolitan or hub for internationalism, was it a cosmopolitan? So, as Sami Zubaida talks about cosmopolitanism in Alexandria, he described that native Egyptian society provided servants, functionaries, and prostitutes for the cosmopolitan Milai. They were inferiorized and despised. This can be doubled 10 times for Bursaid and Smalia. So, even in, even in Cairo, lower class people managed to have kind of lower class cosmopolitanism. Mediterraneans, like Greek and Italians, were able to mix with Egyptians, especially working in department stores because they had cultural capital and they were able to identify with European in, in, in social events like um, drinking alcohol or mixed gender socialization. But who were the Arabs who lived in South Canal? They were peasants who come to Dagza Canal. They were illiterate because most of the work were manual. They were living in a very confined places and the relation between them and uh, the Europeans were not in, in an equal term. They weren't comrades. They were meeting as uh, kind of servants and owners. So in my conclusion, um, I was interested in this research first because, because I, yeah, this is my city and uh, um, I wouldn't write about Cairo. Uh, but um, because middle class, uh, middle, middle Eastern studies um, kind of dropped a class as a, as a relative uh, aspect to, uh, to understand Middle East. Uh, and um, I think um, in recent years, uh, this reconciliation between culture agenda and class agenda resulted in great books uh, like Industrial Sexuality by Hanan Hamad. So I still argue for class as a relative, um, uh, relative approach to understand Middle East, but also not, not reducing moments of workers to strike moments and trying to understand the intimate world of workers. And um, second thing, to understand how colonial enclaves like Poor Said and Smale and South Canal as a colonial periphery really w w played a big role in, in sowing uh, the seeds of um, nationalism, but also political Islam. And they weren't margin or periphery as, the, as we think about. I would like to end um, with a song um, that, is, um, that was sung by, uh, by Egyptian workers just after nationalization in 1956 and how they, they saw nationalization and how they saw the end of this relation. So they say, Ya canal ayama ka'id, O our canal, your days are festivals. Wal'ad asyad wa abid, no more masters and slaves. Ashabik ya Bursaid, long live Bursaid. Long live your people Bursaid. Uh, this is our canal and this is our sea. The canal now Bahrina. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Philip Marfleet. I've got a question, a couple of questions for Neil. Yeah. Um, your approach made me a little nervous because it put me in mind of the insistence during and after the events of 2011 
that we could understand the uprising in Egypt as a function of social media. Yeah. And you remember that there are all sorts of people drawing up uh, means of observing mobile phone networks and the like. There was a book called uh, um, Revolution 2.0, and there's a type of technological determinism associated with modern means of communication. Um, and the biggest problem with that, it seemed to me, was the um, complete marginalization, exclusion almost, of, of, of ideas about agency, about social and political action. And going to 1919, are there not other factors that you might even want to include amongst your variables? Like, for example, I understand that uh, in uh, rural Egypt, many of the protests were associated with attempts to reclaim from the British the food stores, because the British had been seizing, critically seizing grains, and had been holding on to them for, you know, many, uh, for many, many months. And as news of the Cairo events spread, people locally took their own initiatives. Not only did they take their own initiatives, for example, to seize food or to fight the British who were preventing them getting the food, but also, um, they, the British then reacted. Uh, so there was bombing, of course, of villages which were uh, 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 centrally involved in these activities. So, and this, in turn, prompted responses and protests. So some of these actions on the ground, um, it seems to me, might be... Well, in say, is there a place for these in your analysis? My question actually follows on from that, and it's methodological. I appreciate that uh, you uh, focus on uh, quantitative aspects of past history to generate uh, primary data that then uh, enables you to analyze um, the importance of certain variables. In your case, uh, the conclusion that uh, those areas with better communications uh, had higher a chance of uh, participating in the revolutionary uh, activities is hardly surprising as you conceded, but my worry is that uh, those places with l least communication facilities would also likely be the ones that would generate less reported activities. We're talking about 100 years ago. And the data, the primary data you generated is through newspaper reports and so on and so forth. Of course, these reportings from far off places, places that are far away from the uh, news and reporting infrastructure are far, far away, are much less likely to generate this kind of observations that uh, your study needs. Uh, it's a little bit like studying the impact of famine on locations in relationship to their distance from main roads. Now, of course, the places that are far away, uh, I mean, if, if famine kills larger numbers, they're less likely to make the headlines or, or, or be reported in that sense, especially if it's far away in the past. So I think that's, that's one thing. The other thing on, uh, in terms of your reported results on students, which, if I'm not mistaken, showed the highest level of significance, uh, the 99% the 1% significance level, right? That was the only variable which showed 99% confidence interval. Yes. Um, I, think, I think if you check back, if you check back your students' uh, reporting would be oh. double asterisk if, if you use the conventional yeah, yeah. reporting. Maybe you show the slide and I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, explain. Yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. Yeah. So, uh, the, the point I was going to ask was, uh, although reportedly significant, um, yeah, if you look at the student. Yeah, you can't infer 99 levels of significance. The, the, yeah? These, that, are, these are only 95% confidence intervals. But actually, in terms of... I mean, so what, what, explains, what explains the width of... Things, the, yeah, sure. So th this, shows, this shows a 95% confidence interval. Right. 99% confidence interval would be actually closer. Let's look at the students. Yeah. That's Go one little bit. That's 99%. I, I, I don't think you... Maybe I'm not explaining it right. This is actually the effect size, right? Yes. So to uh, infer statistical significance, 
have the effect size, the coefficient, which is divided by the standard error, or the estimate. Yes. Which has to be away from zero. Yes. So at a 95% level, so 0 0.05 level is significant. This is significant. As you can see, communications infrastructure is really far away from zero, right? Uh, so actually the most substantive effect, which is what you're asking for, uh, is population, which makes sense because... Uh, two things. One is the size of the coefficient that you're estimating, right? Yeah, sure. So and uh, according so to this, the, the population... So a 1% increase. So this is an independent variable. It's yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's a percentage. So a 1% increase yes. in students increases the log odds of an event within this uh, seven-day period by 0 0.3. Yeah. Right? yeah, which is small, smaller than population. However, the reported result for students is more significant because of the narrower band, which means higher level of confidence. That's, that's the point I'm making. Thank you very yeah. much. I'm just cool. going to... Let me, let, me, let me respond. So, so Neil, you've got yeah. <laughs> so, less so, than three minutes. <laughs> so I can't, I'm not going to arbitrate, uh, not gonna arbitrate uh, confidence intervals, but I think your reading is spurious, actually. But regardless, um, in terms of data, I mean, these are all super interesting questions and, and very relevant. So... I think the, the really interesting question you asked is about underreporting. So do these, do these uh, findings just reflect and reproduce the fact that there's an urban bias in the data collection, right? So events that are in more urban connected areas that it's inevitably going to be more likely to be picked up. That sounds like an extremely plausible uh, vulnerability. So there are some reasons to think that that's probably not the case, or at least if, it's, if it is the case, it's less of an issue. One is that, is that actually when you have so many different sources if you look at Alaphram, Alminbar, and Mosul, what do you need? They actually have very different um, kind of geographical focuses. Some look at uh, Said, some look at the Nile Delta, some are really Cairo specific or Alexandria specific. So you're, through triangulation, you're kind of trying to get as much of a coverage as possible. The really important thing, though, for getting, getting events in those areas that you know, are not, if not uh, governor at capitals or even uh, major towns, but in the villages. <laughs> are the security bulletins and the RAF reports because they're flying, because the colonial security infrastructure at this point has penetrated Egyptian society really quite efficiently, actually. Um, and indeed, when we talk about connectivity in the Egyptian case, there are about 3,500 telephones in each uh, uh, distributed across the country. There are really no places that are completely off the beaten path. And indeed, if we look at the distribution of protests as it occurs, if we just look at where protest happens, during the mobilization. We're getting, we're getting protests in, in pretty obscure places, but they just tend to have, you know, the, 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 their characteristics are predicted not by their ability to appear in the sample, but because of these other variables that predict them. So I'm, I take the point that this could, there could be an urban bias in the data, but going through basically every single source material that's possible, it doesn't seem to be the case that there's one particular part of the country that's not being picked up. So I, I appreciate that this is, this is a vulnerability. Um, but as I say, uh, the security reports, and also, I mean, the important thing is that, and I'm, I'm really critical of this as a source, but the Milner report, the appendices to the Milner report, which runs several hundred pages, the British put in really great effort to actually go back several months after the fact to recreate exactly what happens across the country. And here, they're actually also very sensitive to the fact they might just be picking up sentiment in cities, and so they, go to, they, they get a great effort to try to actually recruit informants, for example, to try to piece together what happens in the countryside. So incorporating these kind of together you know, in an imperfect data situation, it, you have more confidence that this isn't just reflecting and reproducing an urban bias. The point about technological determinism is, I think, quite a good one. And in many ways, I actually wrote, this is a chapter that's part of a book about infrastructure, effectively, is that I actually wrote this in because I was very critical of the social media narrative about 2011, which is basically, if you have an internet connection, you're going to mobilize, right? You're going to protest, which seems extremely simplistic, and as you say, deterministic. So the question then becomes, if, if communications matter and infrastructure matters, how does it matter? Which is what I'm trying to get at here, which I think is a slightly different question. I think there is really compelling evidence to say that in places that are less connected, controlling for a bunch of other things, like the, the distribution of students and so forth, um, that it does pattern the timing of protest, at least. The other question that you had, which was about that there may be other dynamics, right? So we know, if we just look at the timeline of protest, it's worth noting, I'm just looking at the first week of the revolution. I have data for about a year and a half now of the revolution, so you're absolutely right. Other things, that, things like repression, 
right, could have generated mobilization dynamics, right? There could have been other kind of demonstration effects, contagion effects, all extremely plausible. However, just for this analysis, I'm just looking at the first week from the outbreak of protest, right? And indeed, I'm already accounting for, if you remember, this, this kind of technical uh, bit of gymnastics that I did here, we're basically already accounting for the idea that there may, there may be contagion dynamics, the idea that protest inspires other protests, that's already in the model. So those effects are being accounted for. The point about a rural uprising and the labor core, right, you're effectively, one of the things, one of the master narratives of the Egyptian revolution is that there is, that this is a peasant revolt and that there are enduring grievances. There are quite, there's quite mixed evidence for that, actually. The most compelling evidence for that narrative, I will just look at how people protest, is, I'm sorry, they're hitting me with graphs, is here. Is, I've talked about the first week, which is up to here. This is, this, this is Friday, right? No one, no one strikes on a Friday. Um, these attacks, attacks on plantations, attacks on railway infrastructure, attacks on colonial imperial symbols of power, those have a very different dynamic. So that's the next chapter in the book that I haven't quite talked about. And those are a lot more rural. And those are a lot more rambunctious and unruly and actually look quite different from the first week. And that's because, and again, it's writing against the kind of technologically deterministic narrative, protest as it unfolds, it changes its nature and character, right? So at the moment, I've just talked about the first week, but you're absolutely right. What happens later does change in, I think, quite important ways. Cool. Thank you very much. So another... Oh, I got an applause. <laughs> another round of questions? Right. Final round? Yes? Here. Uh, this is actually for the second speaker, uh, speaker, very interesting, but nothing has changed. I've seen, I'm a tourist guide, and I've seen models of, I forget where, with the Normans, sta uh, large establishment, and the Anglo-Saxons with their big families in tiny, tiny little little huts with tiny gardens. Um, last week I was in <clears throat> Uganda. I arrived on a public boat from my sister's island, Bulago, to a place called Banga. I have never been so glad in my life to get out of somewhere. It makes your Arab quarter look like top luxury. The streets are about three foot wide, three foot deep with mud. The houses are totally in extraordinary. Thank God I met my, my sister's friend with his Boda Boda, which is a motorcycle taxi, and we got out. And I said, well, how can people live like that? This morning in the metro, there was a thing about Henley Developments. They've got an establishment. I don't know where, maybe in London, I don't know, where the middle-class children who, whose parents own the houses have a lovely big green grassy area to play in. The council tenants look over that, but they have, their children have a little narrow band where the floor is bark, so they get splinters. So nothing changes. Except Not a question, just <laughs> observation. Another question? Yes, the gentleman in the back and the lady here. Thank you. My question is also to the second speaker. I found that a fascinating presentation. One thing that interested me was that you used the word Arab quite a lot to talk about the workers, the, the menial workers, if you like. And I noticed that earlier on today, perhaps people would have been talking about Egyptian workers. Could you tell me what was behind that choice of terminology? Was it something to do perhaps with the documentation produced at the time by the Suez Canal Company? Or weren't the menial workers necessarily Egyptian? Or were they from the tribes in Sinai? What was going on, please? Thank you. So a question from the lady here and the gentleman here. And I'm afraid that's going to be it. <laughs> Hi, Catherine Smith. This is also to Khaled. I'm looking for advice, actually. And again, it's in connection with the comment made here about um, apparent uh, um, culture inequalities and race inequalities in different countries in terms of the living conditions. When I was brought in to developing countries as an expert and authority to import understanding and learning for the good of the local community. Those who brought me in made sure that I was contained within a safe place and interacting only in a safe way. Is there any way in which we can overcome 
this expat enclosure means of actually introducing good from outside without incurring envy in the locals of the apparent wealth of those who come outside who are actually imprisoned in the enclave during their time there. It's actually just a, a trial to answer and ask a question about the comment. Uh, I mean, the, the difference in, in um, industrial states in England and other places that there is no race difference. There is a class difference, whilst in what you're showing of the Arab quarters and the other things, immediately give the feeling of color difference, the natives against the occupiers, against the people who live. So that compound uh, the feeling of isolation, and indeed, get the word apartheid here, because then it's a combination of class as well as race relationship. Uh, so, um, thanks. Thank you for your comments. And um, yeah, nothing changed. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is the last paper of, uh, of my thesis: how um, how after nationalization things changed. Um, if you ju just did a small research about the last, the strikes happened the last five years by the workers in the Suez Canal Authority, the inherited body, uh, the body that inherited the Suez Canal company, the same demands, the same thing. We need to be registers, we need to increase wages. Um, it's interesting because Suez Canal used to be this kind of symbol of nationalism. What nationalism did the Suez Canal is a big question. Even in the sense of who now lives in the French uh, villas, they are not the people who used to live in the Arab town. Um, and, and yes, company towns are interesting because it were, it were, it were, uh, it, it, it were like they were the laboratories where the colonial uh, authorities tried their urban techniques uh, of controlling and then they moved it back to Europe. So they, are, they deserve a study on their own. Second question about the Arabs. Um, I haven't invented the term. It's in every archive uh, describing the Egyptian workers. It's in every piece of paper um, or article about uh, the Egyptian workers by, by, uh, by workers, by, um, by foreign newspapers. Interestingly, if, uh, if, you are, uh, if you're familiar with Egyptian culture, Egyptian popular culture, the word Arabi or Al Arabi, it's a famous word related to Poursaid. And it's a very derogatory term at that time because it's used to describe the faceless, nameless um, a worker, Arab worker, or Egyptian workers. All of them were just Arabs to Europeans. So uh, when they try to call them, hey, Arabi, they don't call him, they don't call them by their names. When they felt from, yeah, the moment of 1919 towards the moment where Arabs decided, like the, the people in the Arab town call themselves Egyptian because um, it's a big uh, historical debate when we called ourselves Egyptian. When, when is the exact time that Egyptian realized that we are Egyptians, we are not just Arabs or Muslims or Copts or, this is a big question, but in Suez Canal area, even the, the town was called the Arab town. Um, um, and I have like, um, yeah, I have documentation about how they were calling them natives or Arabs, and we're th actually thinking of them as Arabs, like Bedouins, not Egyptians. <laughs> so they, when they were building their, their, their homes, they were building it according to the life in the desert. And how the, yeah, it's, it, it's a big Orientalism uh, piece, um, how, the, how the French exact, especially thought about the, the Egyptians living there. Um, about uh, safety and, um, and this kind of apartheid places where, I think, yani, the reading about Abadan in Iran, reading about Suez Canal, and reading about Algeria, Al Qasaba, um, I think, yeah, this is a continued reality, and we always think, I, I, I grew up in Ismailia, and I always have been told that do, don't go to the Arab town, which is now called Mahatta Gedida, like, because it's not safety. It's not safe. Only, only because we, we substituted the, the race difference with a class difference. Uh, from my personal experience, um, I, I have no advice, but I just go and talk. Like, those people aren't animals to be confined in one place, and the others aren't angels to be protected. And I think the, the Gito communities that sprang everywhere now in Egypt uh, started with this kind of thing. Interestingly, in Bursaid now, they are building um, new Gito communities. 
like this kind of like gated communities for uh, for uh, elites, and uh, like the the it, it 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 you feel that the roots of this kind of communities come back to the European neighborhood in Porsaid. Um One last thing about um, race and class. It wasn't just class. It it was perfectly race because this journalist from Al Musawwir he tried to find a place um, in European um, in European neighborhood. They didn't let him in any hotel. When he tried to have a meal, they didn't let him in any restaurant saying our meals are, were reserved for weeks. He, he was shocked. He was coming from Cairo. Um, so he was shocked about how, how race defined everything. No matter how, um, how, uh, how rich you are, you were, you wouldn't live uh, in a European neighborhood, either in Borsaid or in Somalia. Um, and, and I think what happened now is like class substituted race and elite become another race. Unfortunately, I have to conclude the session here. Thank you all for your great questions, and please join me in thanking the two speakers. <laughs>